thanks, uh, thanks everybody for uh, connecting and thanks Luigi. Uh, today and tomorrow we have two lectures by, uh, okay, thanks for the recording. And uh, we have uh, two lectures by Luigi Guerrini from uh, uh, Universita, Universita di Parma. And uh, he will talk about localization on supersymmetric gauge theories in three dimensions. And uh, as uh, Claudio said, please, uh, if, uh, if there's any question, please uh, just unmute yourself, feel free to ask uh, whatever. And uh, I'm sure that the speaker will be more than happy to answer uh, to any doubt. So uh, thanks again, Luigi, the stage is yours, please go. Okay, uh, let me start by thank you all of the GGI postdocs for organizing uh, this uh, nice series of lectures. Uh, and also for uh, inviting me. I want also to thank the DGI because it's uh, uh, organizing conferences, seminars, and so on. So in uh, these are times, it's, uh, uh, it's uh, very useful. And uh, so um, today I'm going to discuss localization. Here there are some reference, uh, the original paper on uh, the localization of three dimension, some uh, review for uh, three-dimensional uh, uh, theories, which contains much more the, than what I'm going to say today, and also some general review, which uh, uh, hopefully allow, will allow you to um, find uh, also more instances uh, in different dimensions or and so on. So uh, these uh, two lectures are meant to be pedagogical, but uh, I will probably fail in doing so. So you can uh, interrupt me when you want uh, in the way you find more convenient. So um, now I can start. So localization is a powerful technique that uh, allow to simplify a lot of uh, uh, integrals. Actually, this uh, technique was uh, developed uh, before by mathematician for finite dimensional integrals. In, uh, I think the first instances are very old, from probably 1926, I guess. And, but uh, the application in physics uh, uh, arrived uh, much later in the 90s uh, in the context of uh, topological field theory in, uh, so for quantum mechanics topological sigma models topological uh, four dimensional uh, models but also there's uh, by witness many of are uh, many of these instances and um, but there's another uh, case uh, which is uh, particularly relevant by Nekrasov for the use localization to compute the prepotential of n equal to supersymmetric gauge uh, in uh, uh, for dimension. Later in uh, 2007, Pestun uh, computed the, the expectation value of uh, supersymmetric with the loop at the partition function in uh, uh, for dimensional supersymmetric gauge theories with uh, n equal to or more supersymmetry. And uh, uh, from that paper, uh, people realized that localization could also use in much more in supersymmetric theories. And so in the last uh, um, 15 years, there uh, were and there are uh, many instances of uh, localization. So after this uh, historical introduction, I can uh, start. I want to start very slow with a one dimensional uh, integral. And I want to, so something like this. Uh, so I want to take a real integral with uh, only one variable. G of G is some fu real function. Then I have a parameter lambda and a function f of u. So everything uh, is re real and in general, this integral uh, can hard uh, to be solved, but we can, uh, if we are interested in uh, the large lambda limit, we can uh, use some uh, approximation method. In particular, it's uh, 
um, easy to realize that for uh, lambda large, the integral is dominated by the uh, minima of uh, the function f. So I interested in finding the points such that uh, f prime of u star is equal to zero and f second of u star is greater than zero. So now for, um, this is um, in a way is a schematic version for a path integral. If you think that u is your field, g is uh, your observable, lambda is uh, one over h bar and uh, f uh, is your action. So now I want to be very simple. So let's set g to one. So I, if you want, it's a partition function. And suppose that there's a, only one new star, which is in my integration interval. I can expand my function around this point. So the first order vanishes, I have only this term. And uh, when uh, I put in uh, my integral, I uh, found that there's a, um, sort of classical contribution. And then the, I'm left with some integral, which is uh, I know how to do because it's Gaussian. So um, this is uh, so this is the classical contribution, and then you perform the integral and you get the one loop determinant. So um, this is. Uh, something uh, that uh, is quite easy. Of course, uh, things can be, become more uh, complex if you take more than one uh, dimension or a complex function. But um, the, uh, what I want, uh, the idea of localization is uh, that uh, Sometime, sometimes this approximation becomes uh, exact. And uh, the goal of today is to understand when and why. So let me consider another simple example. So I, uh, I want to consider another integral. So I take the integral over a sphere of the eight function. So here there's my sphere. I take an axis and this is my angle theta. So this is uh, cos theta measure the eight of uh, on the sphere. So this, um, I have this parameter lambda. So there's an I, but uh, for uh, the approximation meter, the, the end of the day doesn't matter. So I have uh, the, if I expand the measure, I find I found this. So um, I can compute this integral for large lambda. The set all points are at theta equals zero, at theta equal pi. So here I have two contribution from the. Uh, to fixed points, uh, uh, to the to stationary points, sorry. And this is the integral. Of course, I'm uh, uh, cheating because this integral is, sorry, here I forget one piece. Coming from the measure. This integral can be computed exactly because it's uh, quite simple and uh, what the, you will uh, find is that this integral is exact. So 
uh, what I want to discuss uh, today is uh, why. Let me uh, anticipate some feature. Here you see that I'm have uh, um, measure and um, integrate uh, integral function that uh, doesn't depend on phi. So uh, there's a there's a symmetry, which is the symmetry of uh, which rotates uh, phi in phi plus uh, beta. And you can notice that the two stationary points are actually the fixed point of my this uh, U1 action. So uh, this, uh, in, a, in a way, the integral is uh, localizing around uh, my on my fixed point, that the reason of the name uh, localization. Now I, so if there is a, there's any question? Is there any question? No, okay. Um, now I want to set uh, this, uh, this in a more rigorous frame. So I will uh, introduce some, uh, uh, notion of uh, math, math, right? but uh, I'll uh, try to keep the discussion as simple as possible. Uh, but I think it's useful to have uh, a sort of uh, dictionary because uh, sometimes uh, it's uh, used also in paper. So. Uh, Okay, um, now we will be a little bit more general. So we take a manifold M with uh, no boundary. And we assume that this uh, dimension is equal to 12. We, um, yeah, we choose also a metric G on the manifold. And we suppose to have uh, some killing, uh, not one killing vector. So d mu v nu is equal to zero. And this killing vector generates a u1 action on m. u1, let me call it uh, v. Okay. Uh, I, what I want to do is to compute integrals and uh, uh, the natural object uh, to integrate uh, is uh, a form. So let me introduce the space of form. I'm, so omega is a form is something that I write in this way. It's anti-symmetric in the indices. It's a tensor omega mu, one mu n totally anti-symmetric. So um, uh, let me also introduce uh, the space of uh, polyform, which is just uh, the sum uh, of uh, all the sp uh, space of form of fixed degree, k is, uh, so yes, n is the degree of the form. And um, so alpha in, a polyform is something that is uh, a sum over uh, different degrees. The subscript well zero is the degree of the form. And when I write an in integral over M of alpha, I mean the integral of the top form. Okay. Um, on this, there are uh, two natural things that I can uh, 
do now now one is uh, very general and is the and the introduction of the differential operator with maps a uh, n form into an n plus one form and is defined in this way. Mu one mu n the x mu one wedge wedge the x mu n. It's um, as probably you, all of you know, is um, nilpotent. But on my manifold, I have also a killing vector v, so I can define another operation, which uh, which is the contraction with the vector v, and it maps an n form into an n minus one form. And uh, yes, so it, uh, it's a contraction because it's, uh, the vector is contracted uh, with the first uh, indices of my form. And it's not hard to see that also this operator is uh, Potent. Uh, for integrals, another, uh, so, okay, since my goal uh, is to compute uh, integral, um, an important uh, uh, result is the Stokes theorem. Let me just remind you. So the integral of uh, over um, the omega on m is equal to the integral of the boundary of m of omega, but in, in this case, the m is empty. So this integral is zero. So for um, what is uh, relevant here is the cohomology class of the my form so let me give a um, very quick uh, definition sorry if uh, this is boring so our form is closed if the alpha is equal to zero a form is exact if there's uh, another form such that alpha is a uh, 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 differential of this form. So if, um, if alpha is exact, alpha is closed because uh, the alpha is this, square beta, which is uh, zero. So there are, uh, for vice versa, there are forms that are close, but not exact. So it makes sense to define the uh, an cohomology group as the kernel of D uh, over the images of D, uh, maybe. I should say that this is referred to the, sorry. This is computed over lambda n m, and this is over lambda n minus one m. So uh, the integral of alpha, this is relevant because the integral of alpha can be modified by an exact form and is doesn't change. So the integral depends on the cohomology class. Now I want to generalize uh, this uh, concept uh, implementing the fact that uh, I have my vector B. So if we 
return to the simple example. I'm here. I'm not integrating a random function. I integrate in something that has a, a symmetry. So I want to define uh, forms uh, that uh, have a symmetry, and eventually I want to keep this uh, structure of cohomology. So these uh, two things uh, can be actually combined in the using the concept of uh, equivariant cohomology. So the the fact is that uh, here I have a U1 action on M. But, um, and what is relevant becomes the quotient M over U1. But this quotient is, uh, doesn't behave uh, always nicely. In fact, it, this is, if the U1 action has fixed point, uh, fixed point uh, P in M is just a point uh, for G, not the identity. So it's uh, in a, it's not moved by my uh, action, my, the, my, by my group action. So in this case, the this, uh, this guy here is not a manifold, for instance. So I cannot uh, use uh, all the standard notion directly. I have to be a little smith, bit smarter than this. And what I can do is to introduce the concept of equivariant differential. So my equivariant differential is uh, defined in this way. So it, you, if you want, you can think uh, it acting on the space of polyform and it mix because it mixes the degree of the form. I have defined in this way because if I look at uh, E squared, I get, uh, I get D squared plus EV squared minus the anti-commutator of DV. But the first two operators are zero. And the second, the, the anti-commutator is uh, known to be the V derivative along V. So, um, the square of the equivalent differential implements uh, the my isometry on this uh, differential forms. So it's uh, something that uh, I um, it's what I wanted, and uh, so I I want to restrict the two forms that are. Um, uh, yes, as I said, I want to restrict uh, myself to form that are invariant under V, and so it's natural to consider the space of uh, uh, equivariant polyforms. So the polyforms which are annihilated by LV. So the equivalent dv uh, squared is equal to zero on the equivariant polyforms, and so I can recover the concept of cohomology. So I will say that a form is equivariantly closed if dv alpha is equal to zero and is equivariantly exact if alpha is dv beta. And um, 
I will have an equivariant cohomology, which is uh, just this. So I'm defining in the same way as before, but using the equivalent differential. I want also to recover some notion of Stokes theorem. So let me consider the integral of uh, an equivalent the exact form. So this is on M. So yes, here I expand my polyform. So remember that I have to uh, take the top com only the top component to compute the integral. So when uh, uh, the differential it, it's the beta 12, it uh, gives a 12 plus one, which is zero. While uh, the contraction gives a 12 minus one degree uh, form, which is uh, ag again zero. The only uh, 12 degree form is uh, the acting on uh, beta 12 minus one. on M and this is zero. So also I have recovered uh, all the notion of uh, stock theory and cohomology, but uh, implementing the fact that I have uh, this uh, isometry. So my goal is to uh, compute the integral of a equivariantly of equivariant polyform, but not, uh, um, sorry, lambda v, but uh, because of the Stokes theorem, I can restrict my attention to equivalently closed polyform. Is there any question? Okay, now we can, uh, I can uh, explain how this integral can be performed. So let me call this uh, guy E and let me introduce an auxiliary form alpha T, which is this. So T is a, a real uh, parameter and beta is uh, an equivalent polyform, which I went to, eventually I will specify uh, later. Okay, and I want to consider this integral here, the integral of alpha T. Oh, um, the exponential is, um, if you want to define uh, as this, um, but the series expansion and the product is uh, the wedge product, the product between forms, I mean. So it's, uh, if you want, it's a formal, uh, a compact way of writing. Okay, so this, uh, function e of t as the nice property that for t equals zero, it's equal to i. But the situation is even better than this because my claim is that, that this integral doesn't depend on t. So to show this, I introduce, uh, I act with the derivative with respect to t. So here, maybe there's a minus, I get dvb uh, goes down and I'm left uh, 
with this, but alpha is closed, so I can bring uh, it inside the derivative. And also, so the, here I'm using that dv alpha is equal to zero, but I'm also using that LV beta is equal to zero. So this becomes an, uh, a total equivalent differential and this is zero. So I can uh, compute uh, this uh, E of T for uh, the value, for any value of T and the, for t equals zero is my integral, so I can actually write e equal e of t, but I can compute this integral, for instance, at for t very large. Okay, this is nice, but uh, doesn't mean nothing up to now. I need uh, to tell you who is uh, beta. And uh, uh, convenient choice of beta is to take uh, the dual form to my killing vector. So d beta will give me d beta. And then I have to contract with uh, V. So I get V mu, V mu. So my integral, if I go here, will be something like this. So, this uh, v squared is a function. I can uh, use the uh, approximation method for um, this. And, and so my integral localizes around the point v squared equals zero, with, which are uh, the fixed point of my u1 action. So, and we let me define the localization locus as the point in M so that V squared is equal to zero is the localization locus. So this uh, locus can be whatever you want. It can be a, a set of discrete points, can be some uh, lower dimensional manifold, uh, we'll uh, discuss uh, at least the fixed point, uh, the discrete set of point case. So uh, you can write like this. So um, I, if you want, uh, we can translate uh, the example uh, of the sphere in uh, this language. So let me recall the integral was this. So V is equal to phi. So the killing vector is the phi is the, where phi is the, this angle, beta is this angle, and the, yeah, it's quite horrible, the uh, drawing, but... And uh, what you want to integrate is this form. My, oh, yes, the metric uh, is the standard metric of S2. And uh, if you want, you can compute uh, uh, beta. This. Mm. 
which is starts now to be since if I, okay. So if you repeat all the arguments, you find that uh, the, uh, you find uh, the results. So, um, uh, concerning uh, the choice of beta, I, I've chosen, uh, this is a choice that uh, uh, makes uh, the, the localization work, but there might be other choice that work better. It's uh, up to you. This is sometimes called uh, the choice of the localization scheme. And um, actually is uh, something that uh, it's very interesting to come because uh, what, suppose that you reduce to, in different integrals. So you, you have uh, two schemes, beta one and beta two, and you reduce to different uh, locus, the integrals. So the integrals here can look uh, in a different way. You are left, but they must, be, they are actually the same. And eventually because they differ uh, by, uh, an equivariantly exact form. Okay. If uh, you are okay with this, uh, I can uh, give you um, another uh, concrete example. But uh, in doing so, I want also to in introduce the um, role of supersymmetry. So I will start to leave this uh, uh, differential geometric uh, language to move to a more uh, physical supersymmetric language. So I want, I want to introduce some notion of supersymmetry. So I need some, something which is uh, some sort of fermion. So something that is uh, anti-commuting and what is a, can be anti-commuting here is the differential. So because the, the deck, the X are uh, anti-commuting. So I, the idea is to trade this, uh, the X mu with some Grassmann variable psi mu, where mu runs from one over to 12. So in this uh, new notation, a differential forms uh, will be a function of X and psi, and this is uh, Something like this. So now I have uh, X mu, which are uh, 12 bosonic coordinates, and psi mu, which are 12, 12 fermionic coordinates. I can uh, introduce an operator delta, which is, will be my supersymmetry which act in the following way. Delta X mu is Psi mu and Delta Psi mu is V mu of X. So you see that uh, Delta squared is LV. And uh, so what I'm doing is I'm, I'm uh, replacing my equivalent differential with my supersymmetry. So uh, now I have to define uh, the integration. So uh, again, uh, this uh, is something like 
the duality x alpha of x and function here. So here I, I claim that this is can be written as in this way. So uh, my goal now becomes to compute the integral of alpha, which coincides with the integral of uh, this uh, uh, new way or uh, uh, alpha of x and psi, which is uh, uh, just uh, another way of writing differential forms. And as uh, I consider the equivalently closed form, now I consider super forms uh, which are invariant under supersymmetry. Period, just, just one thing, since you might wonder if this measure is uh, well defined and actually you can uh, check that uh, since a mu transform as the dx mu under change of coordinates, uh, the integral, uh, uh, the measure is uh, invariant uh, under change of coordinates. Okay, essentially now I repeat this, the argument that I gave you before. So I introduce a, a parameter, a fissures uh, parameter T, which deforms my integral. And this uh, and you can uh, easily check that is uh, doesn't depend of, of t if uh, the square v is well, the square w is equal to zero. Now I have to tell you who is uh, w and w is v mu g mu nu sine nu. And please, if we go back to our supersymmetry transformation here, you see that this is just delta psi mu, g mu nu, psi nu. So it's uh, my fermion contracted with its variation. This will be the case also for uh, the infinite dimensional case. Now you can uh, compute the variation of W and it's not hard to, to see that this is the lambda V nu. If you, or if you try to compute, remember that uh, there are some objects that uh, anti-commutes, so pay attention to signs plus V square. So this is my result. And uh, okay, so here you recover essentially the same results as before. So the integral for large t will be dominated by this uh, guy here. And so it localizes on fixed points. Now let me, one can also compute this. And you find that this is proportional. No, this is actually exactly this. So it's the uh, derivative of the metric. But I chose my vector to be killing. And so this is zero. And so we are perfectly 
fine with this. Okay. So now I need uh, to make some assumption on my um, locus. I want, and uh, so I will suppose that my localization locus is made by a discrete uh, set of fixed points. So there's no submanifold, no uh, involved geometry here. So, okay. Now you can, um, uh, expand your DV. So what, sorry, what you have to do now is uh, just a semi-classical uh, semi -classical analysis. So you expand your DV and uh, you will get something like this. For some matrix, uh, H and some matrix S. And uh, so you, you can uh, put in your integral. It's also convenient to rescale my integration variable. by a factor square root of t. And so I'm left with something like the integral of x prime, integral over psi prime, to the minus a half h mu nu, X mu, X new. Oh, Enter all here. So okay. X prime, X prime minus a half psi prime new. S mu new psi prime new. And you know how to do this integral. So for that uh, t, what is uh, uh, so here? Uh, what is uh, so? Sorry, let me be just be more precise. I'm here. I'm expanding. Uh, I've uh, I'm around uh, some point uh, like x star, I'm choosing one x star in mv and I'm expanding around this uh, x star. And eventually I want, I can set x star to be zero in my coordinates. So here there's a, is a polyform, but what uh, really matters is the zero component because it this has this psi over square root of t. So I have alpha zero zero, and then I have to evaluate the one loop determinant, which is the path pian of the matrix S over the square root of the, the determinant of H. So this is not very satisfactory because uh, you have to compute the form of S and H. Actually, we can, uh, avoid these steps and I uh, uh, can this small trick. And so I will define a linearized supersymmetry. Which is defined in this way. Just the linearization of the general supersymmetry transformation around my fixed point.
so if I, this is, let me call the quadratic expansion with a subscript two. And now I impose that the linearized supersymmetry kills my quadratic uh, contribution. From this, you find that h mu nu is equal to s mu lambda d nu b lambda or zero. Notice that this d nu v lambda is the linearized action of my isometry around the fixed point. So if I use this relation in my ratio of determinants, so the Fafian is the equal to the square root of the determinant. So here I get the determinant of the, this or this uh, action and nothing else because uh, the Fafian is equal, uh, S is proportional to H, there's a square root and the, so here there's a simplification between the determinant of H. So if uh, I use this result uh, here, I, and I sum over all the fixed point, I can write the, my final formula, there's a minus, uh, yeah. The sum over the fixed points of alpha zero P over the determinant of the linearized action around the fixed point. Any questions about this? Okay, let me go on uh, for five minutes and then we will have a break. I just want to say what uh, happens uh, if uh, MV is uh, a submanifold, uh, is continuous, uh, so it's a submanifold. I will be very sketchy, so let me draw a cartoon. So this is my manifold M. This line is uh, MV. So what essentially you can do is to split uh, your coordinates in a something which points in the uh, normal direction and something that points, uh, sorry, this is X prime, this is X zero. X zero points in the tangent direction to MV. So X, X zero is parameterized uh, my localization locus, X prime represent their fluctuation around it. So we'll, you will have, you will uh, take uh, the coordinate and you expand in this way. So you have something that is easy and something that is hard. The integral over x zero is uh, very hard because uh, v squared is equal to zero. There's no localization argument and you have, have to actually compute uh, uh, Integrated integral, but the integral over x prime uh, is uh, again quadratic, and so you can integrate uh, this variable. So in general, you will you will find an integral over the x zero, the psi zero of the form computed along the locus, but there is also the contribution 
from the integration of x prime epsilon. So there's some one loop determinant here. We will, um, I don't want to enter in more details because it requires uh, more uh, geometry and uh, so, okay, I think this is uh, enough for what I'm going to say. I think this is a uh, um, good point to have a break. So. Okay, thanks Luigi. So we have a five minutes break, some, some minutes break. Uh, please, if there are questions, just uh, unmute yourself and ask. Thanks Luigi. Thank you. Okay, Luigi, please, uh, if you remove uh, uh, the, the okay. screen sharing. Okay, go on, I see. Okay, we will resume in uh, five minutes. Yeah, okay, I'll, uh... Okay, so see you at 11.05, okay? Okay. I will be not available for a, a couple of minutes.
Okay, Luigi, if you're ready, maybe we can resume. Okay. So let me share again. Is it working? Yeah, great. Okay. Thanks. Can I start? Yes, please. Okay. So before, um, so I computed uh, some uh, localization formula, maybe it's due to a T about uh, independent by Berlin and Vern localization formula. Um, and, but I also introduced the concept of supersymmetry. So let me give you a sort of uh, slightly different argument uh, why uh, periodic symmetry allows uh, uh, integral to localize. So suppose uh, you are uh, to have an integral uh, over some, now M is a super manifold, which means in a very not formal way that uh, there are some bosonic and some fermionic coordinates. And I have supposed to have this integral. So if I have a symmetry V, I can always find uh, a set of uh, coordinates where the symmetry act as uh, the derivative with, with, with respect to one of the coordinates, let's say one. And uh, is the integral as a symmetry, V acting on S is zero. So, which means that X doesn't depend uh, on X one. So here you get uh, that uh, your integral actually depends on n minus one coordinates. And you're left with the volume, if you want with the volume of uh, your, this is, should be a G, let me write better. With the volume of uh, the group, uh, related to V. Okay, but uh, now suppose that uh, instead of having a standard bosonic symmetry, you have a fermionic symmetry. Let's say that, that V is, can be represented as uh, Psi one, as derivative with respect to Psi one. What the volume of G is the integral over psi one, and you are integrating something that doesn't depend on psi one. So this volume is always zero. So the fact that this integral is zero is not very satisfactory. And in fact, what uh, can happen is that uh, um, the symmetry has some fixed points. And uh, around this point, the change of coordinates that you perform to bring V in this form cannot be applied. So what the correct statement is that the integral, so Z, uh, the, yes, the, yeah, the integral is zero over the M uh, minus, uh, MV. So around the fixed point, it's the integral is no longer zero. And so in a, I can rephrase saying that the integral localized on uh, fixed points. This is another way of uh, explaining why integral localize this. Okay. Now I want to translate. Uh, uh, this uh, in uh, the context of uh, quantum field theory. So uh, my manifold or super manifold will become the space of field. So M. Um,
with it. So I already argued that uh, the equivalent differential becomes um, a fermionic symmetry. And we require that this, uh, the square of the supersymmetry is some new one uh, generated by, let's say, uh, generator B. And delta V closed will uh, be translating BPS observables, which is nothing but observables which are annihilated by my supersymmetry. So, um, what we usually want to compute is the expectation value of observable. So something like this, capital Phi is a collective notation for all the fields. And I want to evaluate this path integral. Uh, I'm still missing uh, something which is the analogous of the Stokes theorem. So what actually you can argue is that in uh, this is the, the, uh, the integral of uh, an exact uh, supersymmetry variation is zero. Uh, um, just a remark on uh, notation, I written here BPS observables or variant on the supersymmetry, but uh, yeah, I will always say delta close, delta exact, uh, mimicking uh, the language of uh, cohomology. So why this uh, delta is equal zero? Well, this is uh, to, uh, to some, you can give some argument like, uh, this should be something like this. So here you can uh, do a change of variable in the path integral. So one, in order to have these results, we require that my measure is not anomalous. Another thing that uh, I'm implicitly assuming uh, is that uh, there is no contribution from uh, bound the boundary in the space of field. So in, in some sense, you can imagine that this uh, could be represented in this way. And uh, so if there is some boundary contribution, uh, this argument may be spoiled. But uh, yeah, this, uh, the situation one and two are uh, peculiar. And uh, in the examples, uh, considering uh, uh, are uh, not appearing. So we will, in our case, delta O is equal zero. Now, let me uh, just repeat uh, the argument for the last, hopefully for the last time. So I define this delta phi it is, uh, oh, sorry, o of t. And here I put my action. And now I add the deformation term. So again, o for t equals zero is my expectation value. And you can show with the same steps that uh, this can be reduced to something that is uh, 
delta x out if, and this is uh, the, an important point, del square v, which is my bosonic symmetry acting on v, is equal to zero. So in some sense, uh, what makes uh, localization complicated is that uh, this, the choice of W is not so straightforward. So there might be some problems due to the fact that the, yeah, we are working in uh, infinite dimensional spaces. Wherever we can give some sort of uh, general argument. Let me introduce a canonical localized, oh yeah, W is called a localizing term. And um, let me introduce a canonical one, which is this. As I did in the example before, I take a fermion and the variation of the fermion and so this sum of uh, over capital A means that all the indices are contracted. So this, uh, ah, um, okay. And this dagger is some notion of complex conjugate, which I, uh, or uh, yes, some com notion of complex conjugate, which I will uh, discuss in a second. Suppose that this uh, dagger is well defined. So now I consider the variation of the my canonical localizing term, and you find two contribution. One is the sum over delta psi alpha squared, and the second one. is the delta square acting on say alpha. So since psi is a fermion, this is my bosonic contribution. This is, and it's quadratic, it's positive. So the integral, my path integral will localize around configuration such that delta psi are delta psi is equal to zero. So this is, this equation will be usually a differential equation for bosonic fields, which uh, determine the localization locus. Then you can, once you solve here, you find some bosonic backgrounds, you plug in into the second equation. So uh, here you have this psi alpha delta squared psi alpha. So this is usually the equation involving fermions. In many cases, is uh, enough to choose psi, al to psi alpha equals zero, but this is not, uh, Actually, this is not always the case. Uh, there might be also fermionic zero modes, but for, again, for the examples uh, I'm considering uh, today and tomorrow, this uh, subtlet is, uh, will never appear. Now, um, let me, just make some remarks on what I've said. So let, as I said, uh, this is uh, the canonical choice. It gives you some uh, good localizing terms. So the condition here, delta squared is equal of W is equal to zero is satisfied because all the indices are contracted. So this uh, term will of opposite charges. So this is not really a problem. What is uh, something problematic is uh, this dagger. In fact, uh, 
we are working in Euclidean signature and uh, in Euclidean signature, signature there's no natural uh, um, notion of uh, dagger. So it's uh, something which is might be subtle to define this uh, dagger. So the if you want this is uh, you are in a you have a complex variable and you have to choose the contour of integration. But you usually choose uh, something that make, makes your integral converge. And it's, for instance, it's not guaranteed that uh, these tries have a Lorentz and uh, continuation. It depends, it, it must be analyzed case by case. It's not, I don't think there's any general statement about this. And a uh, further uh, tricky point comes here where you have this term psi alpha delta square psi alpha because uh, uh, in many cases delta squared will give you B, but when they act on uh, psi, they will give also the equation of motion of the fermions because for the many theories uh, the supersymmetry is only realized uh, on shell. And this is a problem because uh, for instance, when you want to repeat, uh, when you want to make this argument, uh, it's, it's not true that BV is equal to zero you will get something like, uh, you will have some sort of contract term like uh, this. So another uh, uh, point which uh, we require is that the supersymmetry is uh, offshore closed. Okay, now that I've made uh, these remarks. Uh, uh, sorry, can I ask a question? Yes, sure. So when, when you have a gauge theory, for example, um, when you define the dagger and choose the contour, do you gauge fix first before choosing the contour or you, you choose the contour with uh, gauge redundancy? Okay, this is a good question. Let me, uh, for sure you have to introduce, uh, you have to gauge fix uh, before localizing. And uh, I think you can choose the contour after when you compute the determinant. I think it goes like this, but I, need to think a little bit about and eventually tomorrow I will uh, be more precise. Okay, okay. Is there any other question? Okay, so I, can include uh, my argument and give a sort of uh, general formula. So suppose that you have solved this, uh, you have determined your locus uh, phi zero. So you expand phi, uh, your fields around this uh, locus and you, so you, disintegration, uh, you have these fluctuations. And here there is, uh, so you integrate out your, uh, you have to perform a semi-classical analysis around your uh, localizing term, you expand, you will get some uh, one loop determinant and you're left with an integration over uh, the locus, which can be whatever uh, 
you want. It can be a sum of number of fixed points, uh, can be a constant. Uh, uh, so phase zero can be constant. And so this integral is uh, an integral over a, a metric space. It's a matrix model or phase zero can be um, some sort of lower dimensional fields. Uh, and uh, so you will get some lower dimensional theory, but whatever it is, uh, it is. And here, so you have, uh, your, this is the classical contribution of the action. This is the contribution of the observables. And then you have a sort of super determinant of uh, quadratic fluctuation. Okay. So if there's no question, I want to discuss the last point for today, so, which is uh, uh, how to place a supersymmetric theory on curved manifolds. So this is the sort my the last general discussion. And tomorrow we will focus on the three-dimensional example. But since uh, this discussion can be made general, I will uh, want to give some general overview. So why I need uh, to place my theory on a curved manifolds? Uh, the reason is that uh, otherwise I will uh, find uh, infrared, bad infrared divergences. So better to have a compact manifold, but uh, uh, placing a theory with, on curve manifold, it's highly non-trivial in general, especially if you don't want, if you want to consider non-conformal theories. So let me start with, suppose now to have a, let me start, yes, with a theory in flat space. What does it mean to, that the, and suppose you want to compute the supersymmetry current. What you do is uh, uh, to take the variation of the action, assuming that your supersymmetry parameter epsilon is a, a fun, is depend on X. So on, and you collect all the terms proportional to the derivative of epsilon. So here eventually alpha is a spin or indices. And so J mu alpha will give you the supersymmetry current. So um, if you want to promote this uh, to curve space, uh, you will, you can imagine that, and you can do the minimal coupling, you will find something like this, where uh, uh, this, uh, I replace the usual derivative with the, some covariant derivative acting on my spinor, uh, spinoral parameters. So in this case, uh, in flat space, you, having a supersymmetry means that the mu epsilon is equal to zero and so the variation vanishes. So here you might want to say the mu epsilon is equal to zero. This is for what for sure, but this, this condition turns now to be too restrictive and for instance, this is not true on uh, on the spheres, which are the, one of the simplest, maybe the simplest compact uh, space you want to consider. And so we need uh, to do to work a little bit uh, harder to find uh, 
our um, our theory on curved space. There are essentially, if you want, there are two methods. One, uh, the first method is uh, very, is conceptually simpler, but it's uh, some more, uh, uh, more expensive, more time consuming and more, so you start, if you want, so suppose that you have some curved manifold M and you can identify some uh, length scale L, some typical length scale L. For a, for a sphere, this is just the radius of the sphere. Here you can start with the plus space action, which will depend on phi, psi and all the fields you have. So uh, the first thing to do is to minimal, do the minimal coupling, which means that the flat matrix goes in the, goes in the curved matrix and uh, the derivative goes in covariant derivative. But then you might consider also a coupling of these uh, operators which couples the curvature. And for compact manifolds, this means to have couplings that uh, couples to uh, negative powers of L. So these AN are coefficient with depends on fields, they are operators. And the same is true for uh, the variation. So here I do the minimal coupling, minimal coupling. And I have also other coefficient here. So since I'm interested only in uh, relevant couplings, uh, and since uh, uh, one over L uh, has positive dimension, so L minus one has dimension one, here there are a finite, finite number of uh, relevant couplings that I can consider. And so it's a, uh, you can uh, uh, ask yourself is, if it's possible to have um, um, sensible uh, SUSI algebra. This should be some reasonable SUSI algebra. And you also want also to impose that delta epsilon acting on S is equal to zero. Since these terms are finite, it's a reasonable question and you can actually compute by end which coefficient you need. This is uh, the first method that you can apply. And uh, there are a lot of uh, examples where this can has been done uh, successfully. But there's also a second method, which uh, I'm about to sketch, which is uh, more systematic. And uh, is also, and there's also the advantage uh, to, to um, uh, give a more physical uh, interpretation on what uh, are you adding. So see, this is the systematic method more system, at least more systematic methods. So let me put the, so the idea is that uh, a super rigid supersymmetric QFT on M 
is uh, a rigid limit uh, um, of uh, a supergravity theory. And the limit is realized in a way that the Newton constant goes to zero, but G mu nu goes to some fixed background. So to clarify the idea, I can, and why, uh, and to explain why it works in practice, let me, give some example. So first example, non, it's without supersymmetry. And what I want to do is uh, to get a quantum field theory, non uh, quantum field theory on a curved space with a, um, specific uh, space-time symmetry. So what you want to do is to start with this flat space theory. Then you couple your theory to gravity. And you will uh, find a theory with is different variant under different morphism. And then you take the rigid limit. So you fix the metric and you decouple the, fluctu the fluctuation, which means the new goes to zero. In such case, uh, this uh, procedure breaks uh, the invariance under diffeomorphism apart those which uh, satisfied the fact that the variation of the metric is zero. So the diffeomorphism generated by killing vector. So the, of course, the isometry of the manifold are preserved. This is rather trivial, but this is uh, the logic I want to follow for supersymmetry. Now let's uh, start adding Suzy. So now I add supersymmetry. But uh, instead of considering uh, the metric, I will, the, so the, I, won't, I don't want to couple the theory to gravity, but to some, uh, background gauge field. So I will suppose to have a U1 current, the mu j mu is equal to zero. Now there's a, uh, you can, uh, when you have this uh, preserved current, you can know that you can couple your Lagrangian to the ground fields in, uh, this way, and then there will be also some eventually some single term. So here, a mu is a, a background gauge field. So this is general. Now I want to do this preserving some supersymmetry. Uh, so the fact, the point is that J mu, my current, U1 current sits in. Uh, a super multiplet. So there are JMU uh, has some other fields with, which uh, are related by supersymmetry transformation. So, so things in for dn equals one, there should be uh, a, sky, a scalar k to fermions j alpha and j bar alpha dot, maybe I'm, I'm quite sloppy here. So this is my uh, current multiplet. 
So here I've coupled a current to a vector. Here I have a supercurrent multiplet. I will want to couple it to a, a vector uh, multiplet, which is contains some um, the vector and the other ciliary field. And in particular, there will be two fermion. So my so my coupling will be something like a mu, a mu, then there will be lambda with the j lambda with alpha alpha with the j alpha, lambda bar with the j bar alpha, and also the scalar pk plus uh, eventually other fermions, uh, eventually sequel terms. Uh, doesn't really matter. This is uh, quite general. So uh, this, uh, this capping is super symmetric. Now I want to have uh, a mm, non-dynamical uh, vector super multiplet non-dynamical, preserving some supersymmetry. And uh, so what, essentially what I have to impose is that uh, the, the, couple, the part of the coupling is invariant, but this is, this is, uh, by definition, uh, so I can, because of this structure, I can separate the, the parts of coming from the current and the part coming from the vector multiplet. So what this, when V is non-dynamical, it's enough that the variation of V is equal zero. So here to emphasize that is a background. So a uh, possible solution to this problem is given by the fact, by the following answer. So I, I choose my fermion to be zero, lambda, lambda bar. And I want to find the bosonic backgrounds that satisfy this condition. What do you have to impose is that the variation of the fermions is equal to zero. And this is, will be something like this. This gamma are, uh, epsilon is my super symmetry variation. This gamma, are, uh, the gamma matrix, the Lorentz generator actually, of the gamma matrix is some uh, suitable representation, but there will be also the other fermions. So, and you have to impose that this is zero. So this uh, is an equation both for epsilon, but also for the background. Here you determine your SUSY background. If you can solve this, uh, you are done because um, then the variation of the boson is proportional to your fermions, but you have set them to zero and so. This is okay. Essentially, the now the idea, so if this is clear, now we can move to the case of uh, supergravity. So every log and the current I want to consider is uh, the stress tensor multiplet. So now I, so since I'm considering local theory, I have a stress tensor and my stress tensor sits in a, 
uh, supersymmetry multiplet, which is the stress tensor multiplet. So there will, will be the, the stress tensor, some bosonic fields, uh, which will play the role of the background and those some firm, uh, and there will be yes, some fermions. And I want to couple this to my uh, super uh, gravity of multiplet. So there will be the metric. So sorry, this is this is not. These are more should be thought as current, not as uh, background. Here is my backgrounds, bosonic backgrounds that I want to determine. Then there. There are gravitini and uh, eventually other fermions, but let me put dot dot dot. So in uh, this setup, uh, it's important to keep uh, all the fields, uh, also the auxiliary fields uh, in the game. Be, uh, because they, this auxiliary field will be a part of the backgrounds. Let me also stress that there may be different types of uh, stress tensor multiplet, which will be coupled in a different way to supergravity to different, there will be different type of supergravity, but I don't want to enter in uh, this detail, I want just to give you the idea of uh, what's going on and uh, so what you do is you start with your uh, um, press space theory and then you couple to gravity to super gravity and then you will have something like this and there will be the bosonic backgrounds interacting with the current other fermions equal term and and so on and so forth, uh, but uh, now you, from here you can uh, choose your uh, background metric and and the couple fluctuation. This and this procedure breaks. Uh, all the super all local SUSI. Apart from those which preserve my background, so I need to the to find the supersymmetry that preserve my backgrounds, and uh, I can, uh, as before, I may I can uh, impose that all the gravity near zero in my background. And so what I really need to check is this equation here. So the, I, to impose that the variation of all the gravitini are zero. And since I'm using a, so here, uh, an off shell uh, closed supergravity, this is important. Here there's, this equation will involve only the fields that I wrote before, so only the big fields of my background. So this equation takes uh, a rather standard form, which is the covariant derivative on my spinner, will be some matrix coefficient, whatever, which will depend on the bosonic fields acting on the spinner. So if I found solution for G, Bi and Epsilon here, I have determined a supersymmetric background. This equation can be analyzed in uh, full generality and so you can determine still in this uh, all the backgrounds that you can find in the, with the first method.
So yes, ah, yes, this is this equation is uh, in the literature is called generalized killing spinor equation. So I think that for uh, today is enough. Uh, and uh, if there's no further question, I mean, now there, you can ask me a question if you want, but I'm stopping here. Okay, thanks Luigi. I'm also stopping the recording. So if anyone wants uh, to ask a question uh, without being recorded, uh, please feel free.